Can I frame a wall? Just ask Bob. Is hardwood easy to install? Just ask Bob. Can you help my husband finish one project? Well, Bob will try. Hello, I'm Just Ask Bob. Welcome to our job site where safety is a must. Please work safe, eyewear, very important, hearing protection, and if you're sensitive, which I'm not, keep the gloves on. Now I want to motivate everybody. We have a half an hour of Just Ask Bob. Everything from the roof to the foundation, or I'm going to motivate you, Hamilton, to get up, get off the couch, and tackle that to-do list in your own home. Enjoy the show. Good thing for the homeowner. This is just a reenactment. I am Bobby Asadorian of Just Ask Bob. Today we're talking about home security, which does literally start at your front door. I think the main issue here is the peeper. I mean, these are common. These are sold all over the country, hundreds of thousands of them installed. But as you can see, I mean, it's a very, very restrictive view. In my opinion, a false sense of safety. Now, the reason the homeowner has to pry the door open a few inches is to actually get a better look at who's actually at the door. Now what we have here is the typical uh, door chain, allows the door to open a few inches, but again, see, this is the reason why it's so easy to break it open. When a door is securely locked with the deadbolt and the latch, you can't give it any movement. Now once it's open a few inches, I can easily pull the door in a few inches, shoulder it and break it. Now follow me inside and I'll show you how to properly secure your home's front door. Safety does start at the front of your home. Now again, you'll hear the doorbell ring, somebody may knock. Unlike the peeper that we just showed you, this is the deluxe version. Four inch door viewer, very easy to use. I mean, you can be standing 10 feet or more away from your front door, clear as a bell, you know who's at the door. You can practically see down to the floor mat in case there's somebody crouching. You've got a beautiful view to the left and to the right. Now, again, you'll notice in this case, the chain's missing, and I don't believe in the chain, nothing but a false sense of security. We have the door guard, beautiful unit. Again, unless you have a side light, you can use three inch screws to fasten it. Nobody can get through this unit. Now, as far as the door viewer, as far as the door guard, with a few simple power tools and hand tools, you know, I wanna encourage everybody, you can do this yourselves on your own home. Very important, security always does start at your front door. I am Just Ask Bob. Thank you for watching Hamilton Life. Today we're filling holes. As you can see, we've got a very loose electrical mass. This is the conduit that brings in the power to the back of the panel. Now, most do-it-yourselfers or homeowners would be tempted. Let's throw a couple of bottles of caulking in there. Not good. Caulking is flexible. That can be a good thing and a bad thing. For a hole this size, we need to fill it and we need to achieve structure. We want to make it strong, then we want to make it waterproof. What we're going to use today is mortar mix. We've got a bag here to show you. This product, just as the bag says, just add water the right amount of water. You want to get it to a nice toothpaste consistency. That's really important. Get it nice and get it flowing. Now we use the big trowel to mix it up. Now we're going to use the smaller trowel to apply it. This is a fantastic tool. It's called a slick. You want to get a nice amount on your trowel. You want to get in here and you want to slide the product in. You want to make absolutely certain that you penetrate. You want to get about three quarters of an inch to an inch in there. You want to work your way all around. You want to get some on the tip here. This takes years of practice. You want to feed it in. It's all about layering. You want to get a few layers in. You want to push it. You want to compress it. 
This will have to harden at least 24 to 48 hours. We'll leave it a few days. This will not be loose any longer. It's going to be nice and sturdy. A, we've achieved structure. B, we're going to caulk the perimeter. Hey, Bob back here on the job site. Hope you're enjoying the show. We're about to install some faucets. Have a tip for you. Copper piping, whether hot or cold, it's under pressure. Please trust me when I say, make absolutely certain the water supply is off, completely off, before you cut into the pipe. We have a few more segments for you to enjoy. While you watch those, I'm off to change my socks. I hate having wet feet. Hello, I am Just Ask Bob. Welcome to our job site. Today we're going to talk about education and products with respect to deck building and fence building. Now in this particular case, we've got pressure treated lumber. You buy it from the store, the ends are green. They've been injected under high pressure with the preservative. You cut it, what happens? No more protection. That's where we go to a product here. Now, Mark, if you want to zoom in on this so our viewers can see, this is end cut preservative green. What you're going to do is you're going to dip some on. You're going to soak it onto the end. Now, this can be buried, whether it's a post for a deck or it can be used as a rail or any, any component with respect to fencing or deck building. Now, I want to show the homeowners some various products you can choose from. Now, let's start with the uh, affordability scale from low to high. This is what they refer to as green pressure treated lumber. Now, this particular board is thin. This is a fence board. You can also get these in 2 by or even in 4 by or 6 by for large posts. Now, this is affordable. However, I really you know, urge you to stain it or seal it. Now, you can use clear sealers. You can use... Uh, uh, semi items, semi sealers, which will actually let all the beautiful grain show, or you can use a solid stain. Now, another item, remember, is let this uh, acclimate, let it sit for a few seasons. Typically, any products you build now, wait till next year before you apply the stains to it, because it's got a bit of uh, a coating on it from the factory that has to has to dissipate. Now another item we've got going up the affordability scale again is cedar. Cedar is just gorgeous, beautiful piece of lumber. Fair bit expensive though. Now this will naturally repel stains, water, and insects. Now this doesn't have to really acclimate for any period of time. Pretty well, once you've built your deck or your fence, you can go ahead and give it a semi-transparent stain, beautiful to show the grain. You can give it a solid stain, or you can just put a clear sealer on it. Now the next item to show you here is composite. Now this particular board, as you can see because of the thickness, this is for a deck. Now when it comes to fences, it's not really composite. There's uh, aluminum fences, metal fences, there's also vinyl units. But any of these sort of uh, you know, man-made synthetics, they're very expensive. Now one thing to consider is, depending on the scope of your project, now if you've got a two-tiered deck or miles of property to fence in, you may have to take out a second mortgage just to pay for this stuff. Never mind what you're going to be paying your contractor. So again, you know, research, research, evaluate everything, make your decision at the end of the day based on facts. One thing I suggest to people is, maybe not as much your neighborhood if it's a new subdivision, but if you live in an older area or find an older area, walk around. See how long the, fence has been, the fences have been around, find some old neighborhoods, and judge for yourself how these various components have aged over the last five or ten years. You know, this will help you in making your decision. Now, another item is legalities. Fencing in the Hamilton and surrounding area, no permit required. However, if you have a swimming pool, any type of a swimming pool, you must get a permit because the city will regulate, uh, you know, as far as locking gates or the height and the size of the fence. Generally, other than that, you don't need a permit. However, the, the height ranges between Hamilton and surrounding areas. Some areas allow you to build a fence six feet. Other areas regulate it up to six, point, six and a half feet. Now, as far as attaching the fence, We've got some other products over here. Again, everything accordingly. Now, you can get green screws, which will blend in nicely with pressure-treated wood. They also have screws that are meant for cedar. And again, they're specialty screws that are meant when attaching these synthetics, these composite decks. There's varying lengths. I like to use 2-inch for attaching fence boards, uh, probably 2 and a for attaching the deck boards. 
and when you're attaching any type of 2 by lumber, for example your rails that go between the 4 by 4 posts, use a nice 3 inch screw. Neighbors, very important, the fence is on the property line or at least it should be on the property line. Talk to your neighbor, communicate. If there's anything that's the most important thing I can drive home with the viewers is communication. Talk to your neighbor with the varying styles. Uh, they're going to have to pay half, you're going to have to pay half. Again, that's in an ideal world with ideal circumstances. So make sure you talk to them. Hello, I am Just Ask Bob. Welcome to our job site today. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about safety. As you can see, we're getting geared up to climb a roof. We're going to be repairing a faulty eaves trough downspout installation. Now, I'm very tempted to say don't try this at home, but I'm not going to because my DIY segments are for you to work on your own home, but it's all about safety. Now, let me talk a little bit about climbing heights or climbing ladders or working on roofs. If you're not comfortable, don't do it, period. You must be tied off to the roof, you must have a safety harness on, and you have to be comfortable. If you meet those requirements, you can work on your roof. Follow us today as we climb the roof and get into some repairs. Common problem with today's downspout and eavesdrop installations is they always seem to leave off a few feet. The problem in this situation here is sort of twofold. They haven't stabilized the downspout, the other problem is, and you'll find this common in a lot of homes, once again, everybody look up, walk around your home, look at your home, your neighbor's home. When this downpipe stops here for discharging, all of the water concentrates in one area. I mean, obviously, it still finds its way down and makes its way into the eaves drop, but all that concentration is going to pull off all the granules on the shingles. The other problem is flashing. You don't want that much water concentrated in one area. What we want to do is continue this downspout, all the way along the roof line and bring it into the eaves trough. I've already pre-made the piece here. This is the unit. We're going to attach it here oh, with the elbow pointing down, very important. Okay, we're going to guide it into here. So again, it's mainly an issue of controlling the discharge. You want to make sure now, bring it up against the building. Now you've got the water following in a continuous path, going into the eaves drop and leaving. Now the way we fasten this, we use special screws. You want to make sure to at least secure the two sides. Don't ever secure it at the bottom. You don't want a hole in the bottom. You want it at the sides and at the top. So we're going to pop the screws in here. Oh. Windy day in Hamilton today. That's one screw. Again, you want to make sure at least to penetrate on two of the four sides. Now we have two choices to secure this to the building. One choice is to fasten through here. The other choice is at the bottom. I prefer fastening through the eaves trough, that way we're not causing any damage on the stucco or that we're not penetrating the flashing itself. The flashing is an integral part of the roof, it's meant to make sure water doesn't leak underneath. Now what I like to use, because you're going to see it from down below, I like to use 18-8 18, 18 stainless steel marine grade screws. So we're going to start by bringing the screw through the bottom. You just want to make sure that you've penetrated it. This will keep it in its place. You're going to have water flowing beautifully. Your shingles aren't going to wear out prematurely in one isolated area. Hey there, Bob here at the shop, cleaning up, getting everything put back in its place. Nothing that I hate more than an unorganized shop. As a contractor, it's very important. All my tools, everything meticulous, everything in its place. I can't stand the mess. Hey. 
Wow, I really can't stand the mess. You watch the rest of the segments, enjoy the show. Obviously, I've got some cleaning up to do. Hello, welcome to our job site today. I am Just Ask Bob. As you can see, I'm sitting on the job today, but only for a moment. I'd like to talk about roofing projects. Interesting on this roof, we have south, south side facing, north side facing. So if I could take a moment to show you how the shingles have worn. Now bear in mind, this roof's approximately 10 to 15 years old. You can see the north, uh, south side here where it's getting beaten on by the sun. You can see the shingles are coming unglued from each other. The granules are literally coming off, disintegrating into pieces. I mean, you can really see this looks battered. This is old. Mind you, the both halves were done at the same time. Or at least I think they were. They should have been. Now, on the north side here, as you can see again, I mean, they're tight. They're adhered. Nothing really wrong with them. There's a little bit of deflection, which is common. I mean, this garage, back when they used to build these, uh, they were on mud sills. So this isn't even supported on a foundation. It's about a 60-year-old garage. So you are going to get some deflection in the boards. Now, what I want to show you today is how to safely do some roof maintenance. And as you can see, just ask Bob's literally tied up today. Don't climb a roof unless you're safe. Very important. Tie yourself off and only climb if you're comfortable. Now, let's find a spot here where the shingle's weak or loose. Okay, you want to apply a high-quality roof tar. And I don't know if you can see the nails here. Mark, if you want to give them a little bit of a close-up. These are the nail heads. You want to make sure to coat them. Put a generous bead of the product down. And then press. Now you want to do this throughout the roof. You want to make sure they're all covered. Right here, for example, I don't know if you can zoom into that mark. Whoever did this shingling, they really didn't shingle properly. No exposed nail heads. Cover the nail head, and you're going to be safe and happy and dry inside. Hello, I'm Just Ask Bob. Welcome to our job site. Today we're talking grout. We've got the tiles. They're dry for at least 24 hours. The longer the better in most cases. Now you want to make absolutely certain that you've mixed your grout properly. Let me take a moment to show you. Properly mixed grout. Toothpaste consistency. Now equally as important is the tile. Very thorough good detailed cleaning. You want to make sure that nothing's inside the joints. The thin set sometimes, depending how you're laying the tile, the thin set wants to ooze out the middle. You know, scratch it off, clean it off, make sure nothing's in the way. Now when you're applying this, lots of elbow grease. Keep passing and passing and you want to pass at a 45 degree angle. I'll show you right here. Get a generous amount down and just keep pressing and pressing and pressing. Now when you want to clean off an area, you literally want to raise that to a 90 degree angle. Pull it, clean everything off. Now again, you want to pass to the right, pass again to the left, pass again to the right. It's all about penetration. You want to make sure that the joint is completely packed all the way down. You don't want to have it not packed all the way down because it's simply going to crack. It's going to develop a hairline crack. You want to keep pressing and packing and pressing continually. Always as you move to another area, clean up everything nicely and then again, pack it, pack it and pack it. Now here we've got the flange for the toilet. You want to make sure that you come up, come up to it. Well, in this case, what I did is I filled the perimeter around the toilet flange with thin set, so it's locked in. It's very secure. So remember, a pass from the right, a pass from the left, constantly on a 45 degree angle. Now, once you've covered the entire area, you're going to let this dry for about 15-20 minutes. Then you're going to start sponging it. When you're sponging it, you want to make absolutely certain you keep changing your water. So we're going to have two, two uh, 10 liter pail, uh, pails of water here. Constantly clean out the sponge, 
one pass with a sponge, dunk it back in the water, rinse it out again and continue. You're going to do that about three times, then at the end with a nice terry cloth, you're going to wipe it down to get off any residue. Hello, I'm Just Ask Bob. Welcome to our job site. Now we're talking today about base cabinets or lowers as they're, as they're otherwise called. Now no floor is completely level, however this one's almost perfect. Now what you want to make sure is before you fasten this base cabinet to the wall, it has to be level across both ways. Now in this particular case we need to come up a slight amount on the left. Spiro if you want to put some shims in. I'm going to try to take a little bit of the weight off so he can get, on, get in there. Okay, the other side too. Okay, now give me a moment, I need to check level. Okay, we need to come up a small bit more. Let's push them in a little further. Okay, let me see. There we go, dead on, and the bubble never lies, trust me. Okay, now that we know it's level across this direction, we also took the time to pre-shim this one. So this is perfect as well. As you can see, we've got two shims. Now if I can take a moment while I'm down here to talk about flooring with respect to relation of the base cabinets. The cabinets come to this point. So you want to always tile your floor before you install your cabinets. Now you don't have to waste tile underneath. But in this case, we still have to install the toe kicks but we also did put tile in where each cabinet's going to meet the floor, sort of the intersection between the cabinets, this way it doesn't want to wobble. So that's important, especially if you're installing a dishwasher. Biggest mistake people make sometimes is they just tile up to the cabinetry, then if you leave the cavity for your dishwasher, it's too low and you have to break out the tile to get the dishwasher out. So tile first, cabinet second. Now we're going to attach it to the wall. Uh, Jackie, if you want to zoom in here and just show the gap, there's a bit of a space here. These walls are never perfect. So we have a little bit of a space there, and that's not good. But that's where you want to use shims. We know we have studs here. This was, remember now, this was our rail for the upper cabinets. So we know where the studs are. We've got them located. I don't want that gap in there because all it's going to do, if you don't use the shim, when you screw this, it's going to actually lift the cabinet up off the floor. So you want to put the shim in, just snug. Grab another shim here as well. There we go. Time for the drill. In this case, we're using eight by three. For the wall, uh, for the wall cabinets, I was using an eight by two and a half. Two and a half inches is sufficient. In this case, I know that these walls are out of plumb. Sixty-year-old home, that's to be expected. So we're adding an extra half an inch in length. And the same with the upper cabinets. You want to make certain that you've got that pan head. That's what's going to actually catch. You don't want the screw sinking into the wood. You want the pan head to catch it nicely. Okay, and you want to apply pressure. The trick is push on it as you're spinning. Nice. This cabinet's not going anywhere. Very important though, every 16 inch interval, shim it, screw it, level it first. Thank you for watching our show. I hope you had a great time. In the meantime, if you want more segments, more tips, you can easily find us on YouTube. Over 50 segments, 50 shows. In the meantime, a tip from Just Ask Bob. Get up, get off the couch, and tackle your own to-do list at home. See you soon.